Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Saving Lives Discussing Critical Care podcast with me, Adi Joe. Today is the 29th of July of 2020. We're going to be discussing this media and investor release by Roche or Roche Pharmaceuticals, however you call it, regarding their drug tocilizumab, which is a generic name. Actemra is the actual name of this medication. And what they did here is that they gave it to hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 associated pneumonia. And this is an update of their phase three clinical trial called the COVACTA trial. It's definitely not a sexy name, but if you want to look it up, it's spelled C-O-V-A-C-T-A. You can find everything with regards to this press release on my website, as well as in the show notes down below. I have to start off by saying that COVID is so darn frustrating to treat. I mean, I feel like we don't have enough tools in our toolbox for this this illness and on top of that now with this with the study we're we're losing just another tool you see we're all quite familiar in the intensive care world with administering tocilizumab to patients who are in cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome now i know that there are people who would say that that's not the proper terminology for it but that's how we communicate and we all understand what we're saying what we're seeing is people who go into worsening ards then on top of that their ferritin as well as their CRP starts going through the roof and they just keep on getting sicker. Well, spoiler alert, tocilizumab was one of the things we all thought was going to work and this shows that it doesn't work. See, in these days of COVID, we've been getting a lot of press releases from companies such as Gilead who has touted about the remdesivir positive outcomes even though, you know, at the end of the day, there's no mortality benefit from it. But this press release was a little bit more, uh, a little bit more easy to tolerate, if I say so myself. And the reason why is because the pharmaceutical company came out cleanly and said that you know what, this is this is not work the way we wanted to. And to quote them, they said, "quote Tocilizumab does not meet its primary endpoint of improved clinical status in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 associated pneumonia." End quote. Oh, I can't I can't express how frustrated I am that, you know, it doesn't make patients better. I was I was hoping that that's what I was seeing making my patients better, but it, it wasn't even close to being statistically significant. It, it was just it was just not different at all. Then you look at the secondary endpoints, which, you know, is mortality. And if the clinical status of these patients didn't get better, there's no way on God's green earth we could count on mortality improving. And this is also the case here. By week four, 19.7% of patients in the tocilizumab group died, and 19. Point, excuse me, 19.7% of patients in the tocilizumab group died, and 19.4 in the control group died. So that, that's as that's as similar as, as it pretty much gets. It's not even like you could squint your eyes and be like, ah, there's a trend in the positive direction. No, no, no. This is like clear cut. There's no improvement whatsoever with regards to mortality. Then in addition to that, patients did not get off of the vent faster either. It was 22 vent-free days in the tocilizumab arm and 16.5 days in the placebo arm. I know you're asking yourself, oh yeah, well that's a difference, you know, a couple days, but ultimately it wasn't statistically significant. We need to be scientists and we need to be honest with ourselves here. With regards to infection rates, these were the same in both groups. I don't know if you guys were familiar with a study that came out of Michigan. It was published on the 11th of July of 2020, currently in the Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases, which is titled Tocilizumab for Treatment of Mechanically Ventilated Patients with COVID-19. It's a free article. You can find that in the show notes on my website. You know where to look for it. But overall, they found that patients with who were on mechanical ventilation, tocilizumab was associated with lower mortality despite higher superinfection occurrence which is expected. I mean, at the end of the day, you're looking at a medication that's an IL-6 inhibitor. So it was kind of curious to see the fact that this was not seen in this particular study, the COVADA study, COVADA, whatever, where 21% of the patients in the tocilizumab arm had a secondary infection versus 25.9% in the control arm. Overall, though, we need to take into consideration that over 20% of patients who have COVID, who are sick enough to have severe COVID, have secondary infections. That's just something to keep in the back of your mind as you take care of these patients. Now, one of the things that did come out as a positive secondary outcome was the fact that patients got discharged faster from the hospital. 28 days, excuse me, 20 days versus 28 days. However, you have to take into account that the very honest authors of this study which is surprising to me because this was a study that was published by a big pharma company. So I got to tip my hat off to them. They stated that 
quote, the difference cannot be considered statistically significant as a primary endpoint was not met, end quote. That's, that's pretty, pretty reputable uh, for them to be able to admit that. So what's next? There's so many things that we don't know about the trial. We have to wait for the formal publication to make our determination. But the fact is that Roche or Roche, however you call it, the pharmaceutical company is poised to throw us profit down the hole and throw in the towel with this medication in this particular case. They find that with this press release, it's sufficient justification to do so. It's extremely frustrating because it's another tool out of the toolbox. We need as many tools as we can. I personally, in taking care of these patients, could have sworn that I saved a couple people with it. But who knows, maybe it was just my imagination. This is the whole thing that makes taking care of these patients with such little data so frustrating. You know, you could go ahead and start analyzing this trial and say, oh, was the timing off? Did they give it to mechanically ventilated patients? Not mechanically ventilated. Let's do some subgroup analysis. How many people were in the study? What were the age ranges? You know, what were the PF ratios? You could consider all those things, but at the end of the day, you know, we just might have to deal with the fact that this was a negative trial. Let's finish off today's podcast by discussing a little bit controversial. You know, we got to have a little bit of fun here and we do a lot of academic banter. So this is a good opportunity to do so. Now, we've identified to a certain extent that some of these patients with COVID go into the cytokine release syndrome, or as we like to call it, cytokine storm, even though the purists will say it's not a true cytokine storm because of blah, 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 blah. Again, we're not concerned with that. But we've started giving these patients Actemra since eh, April, perhaps May, and right now it's July. So for all these months, we've been playing with fire, if I'm being completely honest with you. Because number one, Actemra is a medication that's it's an immune, immunomodulator, I can't even say the word properly, which means that it can make these patients susceptible to more infections. And not only that, it's pretty darn expensive because for every CC, of the medication, it's $138. I don't know if you have your calculators and protractors close to you, but to provide 400 milligrams for a patient is in the several thousand dollars. And so we've been using an expensive medication that has risky side effects to try to save the lives of our COVID patients for several months now. And you know, nobody's really bat an eye at this. And nobody's really passionate about, about the fact that we're using this medication. Nobody's very passionate against using it. But we're seeing <laughs> medications that, relatively speaking, do not cause as much harm as this could potentially cause. In the case of hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, as well as zinc, we're getting upset at patients, excuse me, at physicians in the outpatient setting for using it in the absence of data, you know, kind of like we we're using Actemra in the absence of data. And we want people to stop doing this until there's a randomized clinical trial. Well, I'll tell you what. This whole time, we've been using Actemra, expensive, with potential bad side effects, without having a clinical trial for several months. So what I'm trying to say here is that we should not handcuff our primary care physicians who do not have the accessibility to an IRB or to a clinical researcher or, you know, anybody whatsoever to help them conduct a study and trace these patients and do all those things that are expensive. Most primary care doctors in the country do not have access to these capabilities. Where I am a little bit disappointed is that these ivory tower physicians, excuse me, ivory tower uh, hospital systems who have robust money from the NIH and from other, other institutions to go ahead and conduct clinical research, that they're not looking into outpatient strategies, at least from what I found when I've searched on clinicaltrials.gov, they haven't really looked into outpatient strategies to try to contain you know, the manifestations of COVID. And to me, this is quite depressing. The reason why is because, again, we've just lost another tool out of our tool belt with Actemra being deemed to be ineffective, essentially. So when patients get to the hospital, you know, we have possibly, uh, possibly to be able to give them plasma. We could give them remdesivir, which is super expensive and doesn't change mortality, and dexamethasone, as well as supportive care. None of those things are like groundbreaking. We need we need some help and potentially starting earlier with some other therapy will be helpful to try to get these patients out of the hole and help save their lives. Again, just trying to stir up a little controversy, a little thought, and maybe perhaps even inspire somebody to go ahead in the outpatient setting and try to do a clinical trial on and I don't I don't know if it's gonna be, you know, 
hydroxychloroquine with some other combination with like vitamin C. And again, I'm not saying I'm a hydroxychloroquine believer, but if you look back at the data from other SARS outbreaks in the past, the mechanism of action at least makes sense from a, from a rational standpoint. Again, I'm going to get off my soapbox right now. I'm just frustrated because I want to do anything I can to save these patients while minimizing risk. I am not recommending that anybody go out and take hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromycin without consulting with their primary care physician first, getting an EKG, having appropriate labs done, and whatnot. That's not my recommendation. I'm just trying to have a discussion here. Hope you guys have a great day. Bye.